بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم Dear colleagues, now we are starting a new series in uh, uh, diagnostic imaging and uh, it will cover insha'Allah the musculoskeletal uh, sector and in this uh, domain we'll handle imaging of the uh, major joints including the shoulder, the wrist, the hip, the knee, the ankle and uh, maybe the elbow while uh, I'm preparing now this issue and uh, also we'll handle the uh, diagnosis of uh, bone tumors using uh, plain x-ray, CT and MRI and uh, we'll have also a very long lecture about uh, the imaging of arthropathies and uh, 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 after we finish these items we will handle the uh, rest of uh, this system including the spinal imaging and uh, there are a lot of topics that will be handled in the uh, sector of spinal imaging inshallah now we'll start by the imaging of the one of the famous and the commonly seen uh, joint in the clinical practice which is the knee joint and we will uh, handle the knee joint in two lectures the uh, part one will uh, be uh, about the uh, meniscal imaging and the ligamentous pathology and part two will cover the remaining issues in the uh, knee joint and you know that uh, we usually uh, uh, examine the knee joint by MRI for these particular complaints especially uh, the local complaints like knee, knee uh, pain or trauma or swelling and uh, sometimes in cases of uh, suspected inflammation or tumors you will know that we use uh, a specific surface coil for uh, knee examination and uh, this coil enables uh, us to examine a single knee at a time and uh, the patient position is the supine position and uh, sometimes we need some preparation if we are going to inject the patient with contrast and this is usually required whenever we are suspecting uh, inflammation, infection or uh, tumors. Then you will know that we have uh, the three types or, or the four types of MR machines, the closed one and the, the open magnet as well as the extremity magnet which is a very good uh, magnet suitable for uh, knee and ankle examination also for the elbow and the wrist uh, examinations and we have the, the fourth type which is the dynamic imaging using the uh, erect position sometimes we may have uh, this uh, machine in brackets which is particularly uh, directed uh, for the spinal imaging but it's now available for examination of any part of the human body then uh, in order to examine the knee we use the surface coil and this is the position of the knee inside the surface coil the coil is connected to the machine and the uh, scanning parameters are uh, as follows the slice thickness is four millimeter uh, slice thickness and we may leave one millimeter inter slice gap and uh, in all joints the selection of the suitable field of view is extremely important and uh, if you uh, selected a large field of view then the anatomic details will be very small but if you use a, a very small field of view then you may lose some of the anatomic details at the periphery of the image then uh, the suitable uh, field of view for uh, a standard knee examination is around 16 centimeter then the protocol of examination will include uh, the all scanning directions that are available by MRI including the axial the sagittal and the coronal uh, imaging 
we know that the uh, sagittal imaging are uh, sim almost similar to the uh, lateral x-rays of the knee joint while the coronal imaging is uh, similar to the frontal x-ray of the knee joint and the axial imaging are uh, images are similar to the CT scans of the knee joint then uh, we uh, should have uh, the sagittal the axial and the coronal uh, scanning using the available pulse uh, sequences including T1 and T2 weighted images. It's very important to have the proton density imaging while uh, scanning the knee in particular and uh, the stair images are uh, also important for evaluation of uh, most of the musculoskeletal abnormalities. Then I will emphasize uh, whenever discussing uh, each joint which is the suitable plane of examination and the suitable pulse sequences to be uh, followed. Then for our colleagues uh, in uh, the um, uh, orthopedic or the uh, physiotherapy uh, departments and uh, we uh, have to know the pulse sequence from the images. Actually, radiologists can read the scanning parameters or the, uh, the TR and TE uh, for each image, but in a simple way, in order to know the different pulse sequences we use uh, in uh, most of the musculoskeletal imaging, we have the T1, the T2, the gradient image, and the stair image. And you know that the T1 weighted images, the bone marrow containing fat, and the fat is bright and in T1 weighted images and less bright in the T2 weighted images. Then using the gradient image, the fat will be more dark, and in the stair images, the fat will be very dark. Then you should know that the T2, the gradient, and the stair images all belong to the T2 weighted images, meaning that in the T1 weighted image, the fat is bright. In the T2 weighted images, the fat is dark. And in the T1 weighted image, the fluid is dark. And in the T2 weighted images, the fluid will be bright. You know that uh, the fluid is uh, the opposite of fat in appearance in MRI. Then if you look to the uh, MRI, uh, the T1, the T2, and the proton density image, which is, as I have said, a very important pulse sequence, especially in evaluation of the knee. Then if you don't have fluid, you cannot uh, predict the pulse sequence unless you follow the signal of the, uh, of the fluid uh, or you read the parameters on the fat. But you know that the articular cartilage, which covers the femoral and tibial condyles, is normally full of water. Then uh, you know that water will appear dark in the T1 weighted image and bright in the T2 weighted image. And the proton density is an intermediate image between T1 and T2. And here the articular cartilage will appear gray. Then in the T1 weighted image, fluid will, fluids will appear black and in the T2, the fluids will appear bright and in the proton density image, the fluid will appear gray. Then what are the structures that will show a dark signal in the T1 and T2 weighted image? These are the structures which contain non-mobile uh, hydrogen protons and these are constant all over the human body including the cortex of the bone the mature fibrous tissue ligaments and tendons like this crochet ligament and the quadriceps and calcification whether physiological or pathological and in every joint we will add uh, some of the anatomic structures to the list of the uh, each uh, appearance in the MRI for example in the knee the menisci the medial and lateral meniscus will appear dark in all ball sequences in the T1 and T2 gradient and the stair images. Then what will appear dark in the T1 and bright in the T2 weighted image? And this is fluid, 
fluid uh, like effusion like cyst like the articular cartilage as I have mentioned fluid will appear dark in the T1 and bright in the T2 weighted image the opposite of fluid is the fat and the fat will appear bright in the T1 weighted image and relatively dark in the T2 weighted image fat uh, similar to the fat in the bone marrow and fat in the subcutaneous uh, tissues will appear uh, bright in the T1 and less bright in the T2 with an image. And then you know that uh, dynamic imaging of uh, the joints in general is very important in detecting diseases that cannot be seen on a static imaging. And this was an old technique which is known as kinematic MRI where we can uh, evaluate the knee and the sagittal axial and the coronal planes while the, uh, the knee joint is flexed and extended. And actually, uh, this, in my opinion, has been now replaced by the dynamic imaging or the CNE MRI, which enables the uh, radiologist to see the motion of the joint in real time, almost similar to that of the ultrasound then uh, this is one of the most important issues to be understood while you are dealing with uh, imaging of any joint all over the body there should be a, a method or there should be a way to uh, go through the joint and uh, know the anatomy and also predict the uh, different pathologic uh, issues and the, the, the plan for evaluation of the knee joint is to know the anatomic structures in the knee and where they are better seen in the images and what is the normal appearance of each of these structures, then we will uh, also uh, uh, mention the different pathologic uh, entities in each particular anatomic area. Then you know that the, the knee joint, in the knee joint we have the uh, meniscus, we have the medial and lateral menisci, the crochet ligament, the anterior and posterior crochet ligaments, the tendons, the quadriceps and the, the infrapatellar tendon, the bones including the femur, tibia and fibula, and also we have the synovium uh, if it collects fluid and then we have synovial effusion. Also, we have uh, the retinacular ligaments and we have also the collateral ligaments. Then, as you can see here, that uh, the sagittal images are very important, showing most of the anatomic details in the knee. While we need the axial for evaluation of the retinacular ligaments, and we need the coronal for evaluation of the collateral ligaments. Um, in fact, the axial has many advantages, other advantages, and also the coronal, but these are the main uh, uh, values of each of these planes. Then, in the knee joint, we should have more sagittal images, and uh, we uh, limit the axial and the coronal images. So, the usual protocol of the knee joint will include three sagittal images the sagittal T1, sagittal proton density, and sagittal T2 weighted images. And, and the last one, the T2 can be replaced by the gradient, sagittal gradient or T2 star images. In the axial uh, images, we have the T2 axial uh, images, and in the coronal, we can have the gradient or the stir or both imaging, uh, both uh, sequences, for uh, coronal uh, images. Then uh, we'll start the anatomy and uh, we'll start by the menisci. And you know in the knee joint we have two menisci, the medial and the, the lateral meniscus. The medial meniscus is a, a, like the banana with a wider curve while the lateral meniscus is similar to the letter C and uh, the curve is relatively narrow then you should know that uh, the uh, uh, posterior horn of the medial meniscus is the largest horn of all the menisci. And first, you, you should know that the meniscus is composed of two horns, the anterior and posterior horn, and the meniscal body. And the meniscus is wedge-shaped, meaning that it is 
thick from the periphery and thin from the, its medial aspect. Then the uh, posterior horn of the medial meniscus is the largest horn on, in, in both menisci. And you should know also that the posterior horn of the medial meniscus is uh, tightly attached to the capsule. And this, import, this is a very important uh, uh, knowledge which will help us for a uh, diagnosis of many of the diseases affecting this particular area. Then if you look to the knee joint and knee, you will see the uh, medial meniscus and you can identify the medial meniscus. If you have a section like this, then you are cutting in the anterior and posterior horn and there is a gap in between. Then if you are, if you're having a section through the meniscal body and you have a structure like this a structure, which is almost similar to the intervertebral disc, then this is the meniscal body and this is the anterior horn and this is the posterior horn. And you know the anterior horn by the presence of the patella and uh, the posterior horn is directed uh, towards the popliteal fossa. And I have said that the posterior horn of the medial meniscus is large while the, post the anterior horn is uh, compared to the posterior horn is relatively small. Then in the lateral meniscus in both horns are, are equal in size and uh, then you see the anterior horn and the posterior horn they are almost equal in size and uh, the, this is the meniscal body in order to know which meniscus you are dealing with then the lateral meniscus is identified by the presence of the fibula and also by the shape of the tibia and you should see that this appearance of the tibia is made to uh, uh, let the fibula articulate with this particular part of the tibia. Then you know that the lateral meniscus is identified by the fibula, by the shape of the tibia, and by the fact that its anterior horn is almost equal in size to its posterior horn. While the medial meniscus is identified by the shape of the, of the tibia also, and you don't see the uh, space for articulation of the tibia. The, the surface of the tibia on the medial aspect is flat and there is no fibula and by the fact that the anterior horn is smaller than the posterior horn. And if you look to the uh, meniscal anatomy and you have section like this, then you have the anterior horn and the white gap and the posterior horn like this. This is the anterior horn and the wide gap, then the posterior horn. Then if you go close to the meniscal body, the gap will be small. And this is the anterior horn and there is a smaller gap and this is the posterior horn. Then if you cut in the meniscal body, then you have a continuous uh, meniscal appearance with no gap in between. Then you are cutting in the meniscal body. Then this is the lateral meniscus identified by the uh, presence of the fibula, the shape of the tibia, and the fact that the anterior horn is almost equal to the posterior horn, and here you can see the body of the lateral meniscus. And this is the proton density image of the knee showing the medial meniscus, anterior horn is smaller than the posterior horn, and the shape of the tibia. And this is also a, a medial meniscus, with gradient image. This is the anterior horn and this is the posterior horn which is larger. Then this is the lateral meniscus and uh, you can see the fibula and you can see the shape of the tibia and you can also appreciate that the anterior horn is almost similar to the posterior horn. And uh, very important in this particular image or in this plane you can see this black structure which is uh, lying closely to the posterior horn of the uh, lateral meniscus which is the bubleteus tendon and this is of course is not a part of the meniscus because the posterior horn is equal to the anterior horn and this is the uh, don't forget that that the bubleteus tendon is present as a black structure 
a posterior to the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. Then the normal appearance of the meniscus is a dark signal in all both sequences in T1, T2, a stair and the gradient images. And if you see an abnormality inside the meniscus, then you can differentiate between meniscal degeneration and the meniscal tear. Meniscal degeneration does not involve the articular surfaces of the meniscus, does not affect the superior surface nor the inferior surface, while the meniscal tear will involve one of the surfaces or both surfaces of the meniscus. And this is the difference to start with between meniscal degeneration and the meniscal tears. Then the crochet ligaments are present in the middle part of the knee in the intercondylar node. And you know that the most constant of both uh, crochet ligaments is the posterior one. The both ligaments will arise from the posterior surface of the femur and the uh, posterior crochet ligament will attach to the posterior surface of the tibia while the anterior crochet ligament will go anteriorly to attach uh, to the anterior surface of the tibia. Then, as a rule, in order to identify the anterior and posterior crochet ligaments, you uh, should first identify the posterior, which is more constant. And the posterior crochet ligament is a cord-like black structure passing from the posterior surface of the femur to the posterior surface of the tibia. Then, whenever you identify the posterior crochet ligament, the anterior crochet ligament will be in the image before or after the image you have identified the posterior crochet ligament. Then if you look here and you cannot see the anterior crochet ligament, but if you look here and you can easily appreciate the appearance of the posterior crochet ligament. And you know that this is the medial meniscus and this is the lateral meniscus because of the fibula, the shape of the tibia, the equal appearance of the anterior and posterior horns. Then, normally you see the posterior crochet ligament in one image and the, the uh, anterior crochet ligament in the image after this one or before this one. But sometimes in some, in few cases, and you can appreciate or you can see the posterior and anterior crochet ligament in the same image. As you can see here, this is the posterior crochet ligament and this is the anterior crochet ligament. Then, in this particular example, and you can see the posterior crochet ligament passing from the posterior surface of the femur to the posterior surface of the tibia. In the image before, you cannot identify the anterior crochet ligament, and also in the image after uh, this one, you cannot identify the posterior crochet ligament. Then, there are two possibilities. Either this is the wrong angle of scanning, or the anterior crochet ligament is tall and I will uh, tell you what to do whenever you are confronted by a case like this. In the previous days we used to uh, get back the patient and uh, re-examine him correcting the angle but uh, nowadays we, we do not do uh, these maneuvers and we go directly to the coronal images as I will show to you. Then uh, uh, this is the posterior crochet ligament and uh, normally uh, in some cases and you can see a small dot or a small black dot anterior and another one posterior and very frequently you, can, you cannot appreciate these small dots because of the uh, approximately of signal between uh, the, these structures and the posterior crochet ligament. But if you look to this very beautiful image, and you can see the two dots, then you know these are the meniscal femoral ligaments, and the, the anterior one is the ligament of Humphrey, and the posterior one is the ligament of Wurzberg. And I remember this by the letter H is uh, is um, in uh, is um, uh, before the letter W in the sequence of the. Uh, letters. Then uh, the uh, patellar retinacular ligaments are those ligaments connecting the patella to the femur. And you see the uh, the medial retinacula 
connects the patella to the uh, medial femoral condyle. The lateral retinacula connects the patella to the uh, fibula. Then, if you have a, a, an image like this, this is a plain X-ray, axial view for the, uh, the patella, and the axial images of MRI are almost similar. But uh, usually you cannot see the fibula in, in the scan. Then you have to identify the medial from the lateral aspects of the knee by the articular surface of the patella. The, the articular surfaces, one is long and one is short. The short one is medial and the long one is lateral. Then you see this is the patella and you have two articular surfaces, the long one and the short one. The short one is medial and the long one is lateral. Then this is the lateral retinacula and this is the medial retinacula. And in this particular example, the medial retinacula has been torn. And you see this is the patella and this is the short articular surface. This is the long one. Then this is the lateral retinacula and the medial retinacula is torn. And you know the tear of any ligament in the body especially if the ligament is small by two facts that you cannot normally see the ligament at its anatomic site and the anatomic site of the ligament is filled by fluid signal these are uh, the signs that you, you can count upon for uh, diagnosis of acute ligament injury then we have the collateral ligaments the medial one connects the medial femoral condyle to the uh, medial tibial condyle. The lateral uh, is uh, shorter and connects the lateral femoral condyle to the fibula. And you can easily appreciate that the medial collateral ligament uh, is very close to the, to the bones, while the lateral collateral ligament is not. And this is a good example of the appearance of the lateral collateral ligament inserting into the head of the fibula. And this is the medial collateral ligament passes very close to the femoral and tibial condyles. Then if you look carefully here, and this is the medial collateral ligament. And you can know that this is the medial one by its uh, uh, close proximity to the femur and the tibia. And also, if you look in the intercondylar notch, you know that the crochet ligaments are present in the intercondylar notch. And you know that the uh, anterior crochet ligament is straight. Then you can see the full length of the anterior crochet ligament in the intercondylar notch. But you only see the horizontal part of the posterior crochet ligament. And also you know that the posterior crochet ligament is attached to the medial femoral condyle while the anterior crochet ligament is attached to the lateral femoral condyle. Then this is the medial femoral condyle and this is the medial collateral ligament. And uh, in this particular example, you can see the lateral collateral ligament in the coronal image attaching the lateral femoral condyle to the head of the fibula. And in the sagittal image, sometimes you reach the head of the fibula. Then you can see the lateral collateral ligament as well as the tendon of the biceps muscle and this is a good place for evaluation of both uh, structures the ligament and the biceps tendon then uh, considering the meniscal pathology we have uh, let us say four or five uh, issues to be discussed number one meniscal degeneration the different types of meniscal tears the discoid meniscus, the meniscal cyst, and finally the meniscal ossicle. We have uh, uh, we have um, uh, agreed upon that the normal appearance of the meniscus is uh, triangular in shape, which is dark in all both sequences. And if there is any abnormality inside this uh, triangle, we consider it abnormal. Uh, meniscus and we have to differentiate between meniscal degeneration and tear. We also said that the uh, meniscal degeneration is an abnormal signal within the confinement of the triangle does not affect the superior articular surface nor the inferior articular surface. 
but the meniscal tear will extend to involve the inferior surface or the superior surface or both surfaces of the meniscus. Then starting first by the meniscal degeneration, which means that there is an abnormality within the triangular confinement of the meniscus. If this abnormality is similar to a localized dot, we consider this type 1 degeneration. But it, if it is in the form of a line, then we consider this type 2 degeneration. And if this line has extended to reach the base of the meniscus, or what's known as the meniscal capsular attachment, we consider it type 2 degeneration as well. And uh, this line will be considered tear if it affects only the superior or the inferior articular surface or both. Then if you look for this example and you see the posterior horn of the median meniscus showing a central dot of abnormal signal, diagnostic of grade 1 or type 1 degeneration. And here you see a band-like uh, abnormal signal within the meniscus with intact superior and inferior uh, articular surfaces and also in this example you see a similar lesion and these represent grade 2 meniscal degeneration then a uh, type of meniscal degeneration is known as meniscal fray and this means that there is some degeneration of the medial border of the meniscus itself and this will appear in MR imaging like this appearance and you see this is the lateral meniscus the fibula the shape of the tibia and the, the tip or the medial portion of the posterior horn is of abnormal signal compared to the rest of the meniscus and this is what we call meniscal fraying it's not that common in the clinical practice but you should know that this is one of the uh, types of meniscal degeneration we have three types type one in the form of dot type 2 in the form of line type uh, this is not type 3 but this is one of the types and is known as meniscal frame then if the abnormality within the meniscus has reached the articular surfaces and we call this uh, a meniscal tear and if the tear has disrupted one of the surfaces we call this uh, horizontal tear if it is uh, disrupting the superior and inferior articular surfaces, we call this vertical tear, and the complex tear will be branching inside the uh, horn of the meniscus. Then you remember that we have said that the type 2 meniscal degeneration is in the form of a line of abnormal signal within the horn of the meniscus, commonly the posterior horn of the median meniscus. Then if this line has extended a little bit, it will disrupt one of the surfaces, more commonly the inferior articular surface. Then uh, this tear is originally a degeneration, and by time it has converted into a tear, and so they call this the degenerative horizontal tear. Then look at this, this is meniscal degeneration abnormality within the meniscus with intact superior and inferior articular surfaces. Then uh, this is the tear, a line which is disrupting the inferior articular surface of the meniscus. Then you have the horizontal tear, the vertical tear, and the, the root tear. These are the simple tears in the meniscus. Then the complex tears will include the flap tear, the bucket handle tear, and the, the meniscal capsular separation. The horizontal tear is originally a type 2 degeneration that has extended to affect one of the surfaces of the meniscus like this one and here you can see a horizontal line and this line is extending to the uh, read to reach the inferior articular surface if it disrupts the meniscal capsular attachment but the articular surface is intact we call this degeneration but this is referred to as tear when it affects either the inferior or the superior articular surface and it's a good example of horizontal degenerative tear affecting the posterior horn of the medial meniscus disrupting the meniscal capsular attachment as well as the inferior articular surface and this is an example of vertical tear the vertical tear is usually post-traumatic 
and it affects usually the medial meniscus. You remember that the posterior horn of the medial meniscus is firmly attached to the capsule, and so it is more liable for traumatic injuries. Then you see this is a vertical tear affecting the superior and the inferior articular surfaces, usually located in the outer third of the posterior horn of the meniscus. And the less common, you can see vertical tears in the posterior horn of the uh, lateral meniscus. But commonly, you see the vertical tear in the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. And this is also an example of a vertical tear in the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. Then we came to uh, uh, the root tear, or what we call the radial tear, meaning that the root of the meniscus has been torn and displaced away from each side. Then if you have a section like this, then you will see one horn and you cannot see the other horn, commonly the posterior one. And then if you have another section, you will see both horns of the meniscus then. The, the, the section close to the intercondylar notch, you can see the anterior horn, but you cannot see the posterior horn. But in the next section, you can see the anterior and posterior horn. If this is a, an observation at MRI examination before the diagnosis of root tear or known as ghost meniscus, we should inquire or we should ask the patient about previous surgery because uh, endoscopic removal of a part of a meniscus will result in this appearance. But if there is no surgery, then you know that this is root tear. And in the root tear, the section close to the intercondylar notch, you see only the anterior horn and you cannot see the posterior horn. And after that, you see both horns of the meniscus. And this is an example. You see the anterior horn and you not see the posterior horn. And after that, you see both horns. And this is known as root tear or ghost meniscus. And if you see a tear which is branching inside the meniscus like this one, a line like this and line like this and line like that, then this is known as complex tear. And uh, this is one of the complex tears in the meniscus and is known as the flap tear or the fish mouse tear. And uh, the flap tear by definition has uh, two main components, a horizontal one and a vertical one. Then if you look here and you can see it, there is a horizontal component and a vertical component of the tear. And uh, this is also an example. And you see a horizontal component and you see a vertical component diagnostic of flap tear. And also here you see a vertical component and the horizontal component and this is flap tear. Then we came to the bucket handle tear which is a common lesion in the uh, medial meniscus and less common in the lateral meniscus. What happens is a tear inside the body of the meniscus and by time you got two meniscal fragments and the, the medial one is displaced inside the intercondylar notch giving this appearance which is uh, similar to the uh, handle of a bucket, meaning that this is the bucket and this is the handle. The handle uh, represents the uh, meniscal fragment which is displaced inside the intercondylar notch. Then you know that uh, this is the uh, femur and uh, this is the tibia, this is the medial femoral condyle and this is the medial meniscus. This is the fibula and the, the lateral meniscus. This bucket handle tear commonly affects the medial meniscus. And the result of this tear is you see that there are two fragments, one in the periphery of the joint and the other one is displaced inside the, the intercondylar notch. And if you remember that the uh, crochet ligaments are present here, and uh, in this particular area, you see the horizontal part of the posterior crochet ligament. And here you can see the anterior crochet ligament. Then this meniscal fragment will be displaced below the posterior crochet ligament. And this knowledge, this information is very important in the diagnosis. Then look at the uh, uh, diagnosis of the bucket handle tear in order to predict the possibility 
that this is a bucket handle tear, the first, the first observation is that the posterior horn of the medial meniscus is relatively small. Either it is smaller than the anterior horn or equal to the anterior horn. But normally, you know that the posterior horn is larger than the anterior horn. Why the posterior horn is smaller? Because of a fragment of the horn is not present. Then where is this fragment is? It lies below the posterior crochet ligament, giving the appearance which is known in imaging as the double posterior crochet ligament sign. And you see the posterior crochet ligament, and this is the meniscal fragment which is which is displaced inside the, the notch below the posterior crochet ligament. Then in order to diagnose the uh, bucket handle tear, first look at the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. If it is smaller than usual, go to the level of the posterior crochet ligament. And if you see double posterior crochet ligament, then you are sure that this is a bucket handle tear and you can confirm your diagnosis by looking at the coronal image. In the coronal image, you see the, 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 the medial meniscus, part of the meniscus is present at the periphery, this one, and the part of the meniscus is displaced in the intercondylar notch below the posterior crochet ligament. Then you have the three, the three signs of bucket handle tear. Number one, a small sized posterior horn, the medial meniscus, which is seen in the sagittal image, the double BCL sign, which is seen also in the sagittal image, and the medially displaced the fragment, which is seen in the coronal image. Then you can see here, this is the posterior horn of the medial meniscus, which is small, and here you can see two uh, BCL, uh, or similar to the BCL, this is the BCL, and this is the meniscal fragment, then you know that this is the double BCL sign. Then in the coronal image, and you see a meniscal fragment uh, in the periphery, and then the second one is in the intercondylar notch below the, the posterior crochet ligament, and this is the anterior crochet ligament, as you know. Then the first observation to predict the possibility of bucket handle tear is that the posterior hole of the medial meniscus is smaller than usual. Then you go to the level of the posterior crochet ligament, and if you see two, then you know that this is the double BCL sign, and this is the posterior crochet, and this is the meniscal fragment. And in this example, here you can see the posterior horn is smaller than the anterior horn. Then you go to the level of the posterior crochet ligament, and you see double BCL sign and this is the posterior crochet and this is the meniscal fragment and if you go to the coronal image and you see a fragment present in the periphery and the second fragment is present in the intercondylar notch below the posterior crochet ligament then is the bucket handle tear can occur in the lateral meniscus of course and you know that the posterior hole of the lateral men of the medial meniscus is firmly attached to the capsule, but the posterior hole of the lateral meniscus is not firmly attached to the capsule. It has a loose attachment. Then, if bucket handle tear occurs in the lateral meniscus, this will result in displacement of the posterior hole in the anterior aspect of the knee, what we call flipped meniscus. And the, the posterior horn will leave its normal anatomic site to be displaced anteriorly in the knee, adjacent to the anterior horn. And this sign is known as double delta sign. You see two horns in the anterior compartment of the knee, while the site of the posterior horn is empty. And this, of course, you remember, this is the popliteus, the popliteus tendon. Then the double delta sign, or what we call flipped meniscus, is the diagnostic sign seen only in the uh, sagittal images. 
then you don't need to go to the coronal images for detection of the displaced fragment but in a single sagittal image you can see two horns in the anterior compartment of the knee then here you see this asterisk refers to the, post, the site of the posterior horn which is empty then anteriorly in the knee you see two horns and uh, this is diagnostic of bucket handle tear of the lateral meniscus in the coronal image you can see a similar appearance to the medial meniscus a peripheral fragment and a centrally displaced fragment then here you can see that the site of the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus is empty and anteriorly in the knee you can see two horns and this is diagnostic of bucket handle tear of the lateral meniscus and this is also another example the posterior horn is not present and is displaced anteriorly adjacent to the anterior horn diagnostic of bucket handle tear then we keep to the meniscal capsular separation and this will occur of course at the medial side of the knee because the meniscus the posterior horn is firmly attached to the capsule then it is prone for injury uh, compared to the uh, posterior horn of the lateral meniscus the diagnosis is performed based on that there is a gap between the posterior horn of the medial meniscus and the capsule and very importantly that this gap is filled with fluid and if you see this appearance there is a gap between the posterior horn of the meniscus and the capsule and the gap is filled with fluid and this is particular on the medial aspect of the knee then you may uh, uh, you may able to diagnose meniscal capsular separation in this issue the posterior horn is is not torn in most of the cases but it is separated from the capsule and the separation should be filled with fluid this is very important then uh, if you see this is the peripheral tear of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus you know that there are no ligaments in this particular area and you see that the uh, base is separable from the capsule with some fluid signal in between on the contrary on the lateral aspect of the knee this is usual appearance where you can see fluid between the posterior horn of the uh, lateral meniscus and the popliteus tendon and this is a case of trauma you can see the bone marrow contusion and the edema which is black in the t1 and the bright in the t2 but this is not a meniscal capsular separation then sometimes you uh, have this appearance while examining the knee you can see that the posterior horn of the uh, of the medial meniscus in particular has an irregular outline with a heterogeneous signal in both t1 and the t2 weighted images then in, uh, in in the presence of history of trauma this may be diagnostic of what we call meniscal contusion then uh, this coiled meniscus means that the body of the meniscus is larger than normal this kind meaning disc like uh, meniscus and then the meniscal body is markedly enlarged and the horns are attenuated it is not disc but this kind similar to the disc then normally if you have sagittal, sagittal sections in you can see the the meniscal body in a single or two slices but if you can see the meniscal body in three or more sagittal sections then you are dealing with a discoid meniscus the discoid meniscus is more common on the lateral aspect of the knee but it can also affect the medial meniscus then in this image you can see that this is the meniscal body the meniscal body the meniscal body the meniscal body and the meniscal body then you see five sagittal sections containing the meniscal body meaning that it is enlarged and this is uh, discoid meniscus 
Uh, sometimes you can predict the possibility of this coiled meniscus from this appearance, which is babion like appearance of the body of the meniscus. So sometimes you can count on this, but if you uh, uh, go to the uh, sections and you see meniscal body, meniscal body, meniscal body in five sections, then you got the attenuated meniscal holes. This is diagnostic of discoid meniscus. And this is also discoid meniscus, and you know, the discoid meniscus is an abnormal meniscus which is liable for degeneration and tears compared to the normal uh, meniscus. Then uh, the meniscal cyst, or what we call the vara meniscal cyst, is the cyst containing fluid which is related to the base of a torn meniscus. Then you see here in, the, in this image, this is the anterior horn and this is the posterior horn which is torn and you see a cystic lesion which is filled by fluid related to the base of a torn meniscus. This meniscal or barameniscal cyst is common on the lateral aspect of the knee, but can also occur on the medial aspect of the knee. The differential diagnosis will include the ganglion or synovial cyst, which is not related to a meniscal tear, and the brusitis, which is related to inflammation of any of the bursa related to the knee. We'll discuss this in the second uh, part of this uh, talk. Then uh, cystic masses like uh, hematoma or meningioma or uh, cystic neoplasms and the popliteal tendon cheese fluid uh, or the fluid related to the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus as I have mentioned. But you remember that barameniscal cyst is a cyst which is related to the posterior horn of a torn meniscus. And the common sites are the anterior horn lateral meniscus and the posterior horn medial meniscus. And this is also an example. And you see uh, this is uh, the meniscus and uh, there is a tear inside the meniscus and there is a cyst which is related to the torn meniscus. But in this area, then you see it, that there is a multilocular cystic lesion in the anterior compartment of the knee related to the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus and the horn is not torn then uh, the fluid will appear of low signal in the T1 and the high signal in the T2 and this is just a ganglion cyst. Finally, we came to the uh, meniscal ossicle, which uh, means that there is a bone containing marrow within the meniscus. And uh, this may be an incidental finding with, uh, with no symptoms and it can be appreciated in the plain X-ray if you look carefully for this area and it uh, is very well demonstrated on MRI. And uh, this is a T1 weighted image and the anterior horn of the medial meniscus and this is the posterior horn. And you know, the, the posterior horn, if it is normal, it will appear black. And if it is abnormal, it will show some intermediate signal in the, in the T1 or the proton density. And uh, the, in this area, you see bone marrow which is similar to the uh, bone marrow in this um, in the medulla of the femur, for example. And this is a good example of a meniscal ossicle in the medial meniscus. This is the anterior horn, and this is the posterior horn. And um, this is a good example also, and you should know that um, this meniscal ossicle will be appreciated very good in the T1 weighted images, because the meniscus is black, and the ossicle will be bright, containing bone marrow. But in the gradient or stair images, the fat will be suppressed. Then the ossicle will be black, similar to the rest of the meniscus. Then you should know that for the diagnosis of meniscal ossicle, the T1 weighted images are good. And then this is the end of the first part of the first talk. You remember that we will continue this uh, uh, this talk uh, considering the evaluation of the knee ligaments then we will have a separate talk about the rest of the knee pathology thank you very much alhamdulillah rabbil alameen wassalatu wassalamu ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in